evening wherever you are in the world. My name is Michelle Moore and a very warm welcome to that new era of athlete activism panel and workshop from the FAIR Network. I'm really excited and honoured to be here with Michael Sam and Renee Montgomery and we're going to be introducing you to them very very shortly. This uh, activism workshop and panel is the Fair Network's Football Festival panel, and it's the first virtual one that we have as a part of the Football People Weeks, which is the largest campaign for social change and diversity in global football. During this two week period, over 150,000 people in more than 60 countries organize and participate in events and activities that, to bring about social change. The Fair Network is a great organisation, an umbrella organisation that brings together individuals and informal groups and organisations to combat inequality and football and use sport as a means for social change. My first ask of all of you is to use the hashtag Football Peoples, tag the Fair Network into that and post uh, uh, around all the brilliant things that we're going to be talking about today. This is an informal conversation between two amazing role models and athlete activists, and we will have some time at the end of our discussion for some Q&A. So I invite you all to submit your questions in the chat function on Zoom. So just to set a bit of the context, it's been a year like no other in modern sport. Across the US, athletes have put themselves at the heart of the Black Lives Matter movement by using their platforms and showing themselves to be real leaders of social change. Matches have been cancelled and across US sport, as athletes have withheld their labour in protests, disrupting leagues and tournaments as the fight against social injustice has taken centre ground. We have not seen a movement like this that places sport alongside the call for social change since the days of Muhammad Ali and the 1968 Mexico Olympic Games. Athletes are demanding justice. This is nothing new. As we know, history has shown us this only last week. Friday, October the 16th was the 52nd anniversary of the 1968 Mexico Olympic Games Black Power salute from the athletes Tommy Smith and John Carlos. And that was a moment, uh, a, a moment of time, a marriage between moment and movement, much like the times that we find ourselves in today. So those historical moments of sport activism have laid the legacy for the contemporary sports activism that we see on our screens today. So we're gonna be diving into those topics and we'll learn more from Renee and Michael around their stories of resistance and triumph. So if you were in the room with me audience, I can imagine that you'll be given a big clap for Renee and Michael. And I wanna kind of have an informal conversation with you guys. I'm really excited to be here. So I'm gonna start my introduction. So just imagine that there's a bit of a drum roll and a clap going on and see Renee smiling with me as, as, as she is. And Renee is the point guard for the, the Atlanta Dream and she is a two-time national champion. And she has played for the, Hus uh, the, the Yukons as well and the Minnesota Lynx. She's been playing basketball since 10 years old. She is a WNBA veteran, a startling list of career winning moments and achievements. She is a superstar. In June, Renee was the first professional athlete to announce that she would sit out of the remaining WNBA season to fight systemic racism and social injustice. Renee set up her foundation in 2019, Moments Equal Momentum, to serve the community of Atlanta. Her foundation is involved in education, uh, projects to voter rights and equality campaigns. A very big welcome and warm welcome to Renee. And Michael <laughs> Sam. Michael is the former defensive end in the NFL. He played football for the Missouri Tigers and after completing his football career he came out as gay. He was drafted in the 2014 NFL draft for the Rams and was released shortly after. Michael also played in the practice squad for the Dallas Cowboys and also a one season in the Canadian Football League. Michael retired from football in 2015 but not before becoming the first gay player to be drafted in the NFL and the first openly gay player in the Canadian Football League. 
Michael has emerged as a powerful and prominent pioneer for the LGBTQ plus community as an exemplar of resilience and the tenacity of the human spirit. Awarded the Arthur Ashe Courage Award back in 2014, he currently shares his experiences as an author and a motivational speaker. To this day, no NFL player appearing in a regular season game has come out publicly as, as gay while active. Michael is a prominent icon for inclusion. Big respect to both of you. Thank you for being with us today. I'm wearing my Colin Kaepernick t-shirt. I'm ready, I'm pumped for this. Are you guys ready? <laughs> oh, you know I'm ready. Yeah? If I was- Mike, You're, you're uh, muted. Yeah, I have a dog uh, out back, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be, uh, I don't want her to be barking too loud. <laughs> so if I was in the room with you guys, I'd be giving you some high fives. You good? You ready? Ready. I'm ready. Great, great. Now, I want to start um, by, by thinking about, oh, look, I've just kind of dropped one of my pieces of paper, which is really important. <laughs> down and get that piece of paper. Yeah, go get it. No problem. We'll just <laughs> chill out and wait. Hope everybody's doing all right today. You're a professional, and I can see that. So, <laughs> hey, Renee, I'm going to start with you. We have been, you know, all across our screens, been seeing the, the Black Lives Matter movement. We have been witness to some of the atrocious racist killings. We are in a space where we're seeing sports activism at new levels. What was going through your mind when you decided to make that decision to sit out of the 2020 season and what was the response to to people around by, by the people around you oh man uh thank you guys for having me first of all um i notting hill is my favorite movie i just thought i'd say that because every time i hear you talk now i can't help but think of my movie um but what was going through my mind uh a lot honestly um because it wasn't just one instance or one thing that that went into me making my decision it was watching George Floyd murdered on t live television. It was having all the protests here in, in Atlanta. So being so connected to a lot of the people and a lot of the protesters and then seeing other stories happen in Georgia, Ahmaud Arbery, and it was just like a lot going on when I had to be still. So normally I'm all over the place and I'm doing a hundred things at once. So nothing can keep my attention that long in a sense of I'm moving on to the next game or I'm calling the next game or I'm working for the next gig. and we all were sitting still during this pandemic and I just sat, I was just alone to sit with my thoughts. And so I just knew I wanted to do something and I opted out. And how did, how did people respond to that? How were your teammates around that? Yeah, you know, I, that was what I was most nervous about because, you know, if you, like being an athlete, the last thing you ever want to do is let your teammates down. It's like when you have to run sprints and everybody has to run because of you, you never want to be that person. So I didn't want to have that conversation and I didn't want to be that person and they didn't make me feel like that person. So they, they all were like, you know, we get it. You know, even my, my head coach, they all were like, man, that's tough. We wanted to have you here, but we do get it. So for me, that was, that was everything. Great. And, and so for you, Sam, in the same, Michael, Robert, in the same way, when you decided to, to come out at a really critical point in your career, what was going through your mind as, as you were thinking about, you know, being drafted and, and looking back, is there anything that, that you, you may have done differently? So uh, I actually came out uh, my senior year in at University of Missouri uh, in 2013. Mm -hmm. And it was very spontaneous. Uh, me and my ex, uh, we broke up with my boyfriend in college. We broke up in, uh, in May of 2013. And during and at that time, I was still in the closet. Um, even though my teammates knew, the athletic department knew, a, a great portion of the student body knew, uh, but it was still quiet. And that summer, I really needed to focus on who really, who really was, was I. And by the time of camp, uh, actually St. Louis, I went to St. Louis Pride that, uh, that June as well. And I felt more comfortable. Uh, you know, just being out in public. And that August, when I came, uh, first day of camp, uh, Coach Pinkle has these crossover meetings where you tell a little bit about yourself, you know, who, who, what's your name, where you're from, what's your major, and something about yourself that no one knows. And I, I got in front of my, my teammates. My name is Michael Sam. My major is support management. 
Uh, I'm from Hitchcock, Texas, and I'm gay. And that's when I came out. And I had the best uh, successful season during my, uh, my college year that year. Now, I came out publicly uh, uh, several months later, and it wasn't planned. I, I had no intentions of coming out publicly because I, I felt in my mind I was already out. And as long as my teammates know, that's all the people that needed to know. Um, we, my team, I did not hire the right team at the time. Uh, we, we were, no one, no one could predict the outcome but there was not enough planning. Uh, it was definitely not enough planning. Something this big should have, we should have been patient. And uh, there was not a lot, enough thought to it. And I think uh, people were thinking short term instead of long term. Right, and so the idea of having people around you to enable you to think more strategically about this decision was, was kind of something that you look back on and think, I wish we'd, I'd have done that differently. Absolutely. If, if we would have took our time a year or two of me playing, because I, I wasn't, I came out and I wasn't going to come back in. Now, if we would have took our time and planned it, this, this, something like this big is going to affect generations to come, not just sports in America, but sports across the world. And we, and of course we were amateurs. We didn't have, we didn't listen. We didn't, well, I mean, I had no idea. I mean, of course, I was focusing on trying to make a team, but I did not have the right team to make the uh, to come up with these ideas and and talk me through because uh, this is something big. I mean, it's almost like too big to fail. You know, it's it's it's, it's it, was, it will affect everyone across the world, and uh, we did not take our time. We weren't patient enough. I think that's a really important point about the kind of strategy and and who you've got around you and your team's response and the league's response. So. Renee, if I, I kind of just come to you around the WNBA and they've been, you know, dedicated the year to social justice and they have been working around activism and the Black Lives Matter movement way before this year. And it's been a part of their, their kind of strategy, if you like. But, you know, in terms of how they've enabled you to be an activist, how they've enabled you to be able to make that decision, how, how have they done that? How, how have they achieved that? You know, they allowed me to to express myself and however I wanted to, you know, right when I even when I opted out, you would think that the league would shy away or the league would kind of be like, all right, see you next season. But the players, the commissioner, everybody involved in the league, I started doing a um, NBA TV gave me a show called WNBA Weekly. So I started interviewing two players a week. So I felt very connected to the Wubble. I was talking to players more than I probably normally would have because they would have been my opponents. And so I started talking to players more often. I'm talking to them about what's going on in the bubble. How are you feeling? Are you exhausted? Are you mentally exhausted? And I just felt like I was getting connected to players in a way different way than I had before. And, and no one talked to me like any type of way, like, you know, no one felt like <clears throat> no one talked to me like they were mad. No one talked to me like they didn't like what I did. Everyone almost pretty much everyone had told me like, you know, they love what I'm doing. And so for me, that meant a lot because these were my peers. You know, this isn't like my teammates only. These are players that I play against. And this is the commissioner of the WNBA. And so I think the way that people, the WNBA allows us to be us, it, it's, it feels good because then we all support each other. And everybody saw this year, the WNBA, every, every week they were doing a Say Her Name campaign, but they were also having shirts that they wore into the arena, having messaging, they boycotted as well with the other leagues. And so everything they did, they moved as a unit. And for me, that, that showed unity, that showed that everybody was on the same page. And so that's hard to do, you know, with the large amount of people, that's not easy, but the WNBA did it. And just, you know, as a, as a, as an athlete, I'm a former athlete, nowhere near of any kind of massive level, <laughs> really, but you know, was, was there just a part of you that was like, Oh no, I really want to be playing, you know, I'm, you know, except oh, yeah. if you're interviewing uh, ballers every week. So was there a part of oh, you yeah. that was frustrated about that? Yeah, I mean, I like you said, I've been playing since I was 10. So it's pretty much a part of my identity. Like, you know, and they say they tell us all the time, like sports shouldn't be a part of your identity. It's just something you do. But yeah, right. It's part of my identity. I've been doing it since I was 10. 
you know, so I've been playing sports for 20 plus years. Yeah, that's more than half of my life. And so when I watch games, of course, like I'm like, oh man, you should have done this. Oh, you know, she does that every time. Like I'm watching, like, you know, I'm super fan, but I'm also very knowledgeable of, of the players because I just played against them. So it made my competitive juices start flowing when I watch sometimes. But in the same breath, there was so much going on and I was so happy with what I've been able to, with who I've been able to connect with and, and, and what I've been able to do here in Atlanta. So that kind of is a good balance. And just talking about kind of women's sport and how, how the intersections between sport and race and gender play, play themselves out. You know, we know that, that if, if you're an athlete and the way in which you choose to articulate and uh, sh show your, your activism is very different to how that's perceived if you're a male athlete. And the WNBA, you know, initially teams and players were sanctioned for their protests and, there's a real uh, kind of difference in the WNBA and the NBA. And if we think about it more broadly in terms of athletes and women that come back from having babies and, and how sport does or doesn't embrace them to um, out and proud, proud gay swimmers, there's a whole issue there around women's sport and especially that underlying some of the intersectionalities of that within the Black Lives Matter movement and what's going on through sport. What are your observations around that? Yeah, I mean, the WNBA, I mean, I think we sit right at the crossing point of the intersection. You know, there's, there's, we're a league comprised of all women and then 80% minority. So, I mean, we are the intersection. So we understand what it's like. And so I think a lot of people were really curious, how could a whole league move like that? And, and it doesn't matter if you're the, the non-minorities, you still know what it's like to be a female basketball player. So you know what that means. And when we say that on the internet, that means something, you know, like for a while there it was, it was just the cool thing to do to be a troll. Like we all know it. Every time we posted something, people were like, oh, get in the kitchen. What? This is still a thing. People are at the games. Like, you know, like we're used to that. So we're used to having a certain level of scrutiny just because we're women playing the same sport that they love when men play. So we, that, that has been a part of our identity almost since, well, since I've been in the league or since social media has been a thing. Um, but I love that none of us really care. I, I tweeted one time that we're a league of unbothered women because they could put oh, that every it. single time. I love like, it. Renee, Renee, say that again. That's a tweetable moment. Say that again. Yeah, we're a league of unbothered women. I mean, people have been trolling us for years now. And I don't know one player that is actually like actually affected other than making them laugh. Like, you know, it's it's almost comical at this point. So when we talk about fighting for rights and fighting for equality and different things, well, as female hoopers, we've been fighting a long time. So this is this is not new to us. Yeah, thank you. And and Michael, you know, despite previously there have been players that have come out in the in, in the NFL. You know, there have been gay players that have come out across sport. John Amici uh, in basketball, he's one of my friends and he's also somebody who was the first Englishman to come out in, in basketball um, and, you know, to the likes of Jason Collins. You know, there's a lot of gay athletes that have come out, but there are still no openly gay players in men's top professional soccer. Based on your experience, um, what structural support should the sport provide to create an environment where people can be open about their sexuality? So uh, the NFL just uh, on National Coming Out Day, uh, the NFL did this uh, this reel. This is a reel, which about two minutes, which was, was really cool and showed their support. Uh, that's all good and, and all, but they need more representation. Uh, they need to have, there need to be a safe place within the organization. And this is not just the NFL, this is all uh, top uh, leagues and uh, organizations where it need to have a safe place and representation so it could, uh, athletes can feel comfortable. Right now, you can use my career as a, uh, as an example. Uh, for uh, Michael Sam, who was an All-American SEC Defensive Player of the Year, you know, he had all these accolades and he only lasted one year in the NFL. Your career is at stake. And, you know, and athletes have to think about them, their families, their livelihoods. So it's, it, the, the executives and owners need to create more safe places for athletes and have more representations uh, and, 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 and a seat at the table. You know, like there need to be more people in the organization that's LGBTQ 
And I think this will be a good uh, a good starting point and for for years to come. Yeah, it's really interesting. I saw that that video that, that came out that was, uh, you know, had Ryan Russell and um, Ryan Collahan at, at uh, you know, really speaking powerfully on it. I mean, there's something about representation at a strategic level for sure. But there's also something about how sports activism has changed. It's still not uh, comfortable. And even if the, the NFL is saying, oh, yeah, well, we will embrace you. It's still not a safe space. How have you seen the role of athletes as activists change since you retired in 2015? I, I always go back to Chris Long. Chris Long, who was, uh, who was a, with my former teammate. And the way, not only did he support me, but he also supported you know, the, uh, the Black Lives Movement. He was just an active supporter. And we need more, and he was white too. Uh, and he's out there, this white guy, just one of, everyone's like all these black uh, activists and, and it is Chris Long. And the, the C, he was one of the first to support uh, Colin Kaepernick as well. And just, we need more athletes like him. We need more people like him. Uh, just, uh, just out there supporting and doing what they can. And I, I see more athletes, I see more white athletes um, also taking a stand as well. And, and I think Chris Long is, the, is a great example. Yeah, a really important point about that, that allyship of, of, of white athletes, yeah. So we know, just kind of segueing a bit here, we know the cultural power that sport has. We know that sport kind of punctures privilege and, you know, it often needs an athlete to say it for people to hear it. It kind of goes into the mainstream and, and affects people that are unaffected by systemic racism and oppression. And it has a huge symbolic power. So given this and given everything that's happening in the US at the moment, given the voter suppression, given the, the, the whole ecosystem of what's going on around sport and politics, within and the context of the Black Lives Matter movement, do you think it's necessary for black athletes to be activists? And do you think that they have to move beyond kind of this symbolic leadership um, to create real change? And there's something about as well, the, you know, the, in the Europe, we look towards the US in terms of the lead for sports activism. So how can we, how can we learn from that? But is it a real necessity for athlete, for black athletes to be activists? I'm gonna to go to you first, Renee. Yeah, I would say, you know, the thing I always say, people don't have to do anything. You know, I've heard a lot of athletes say, I'm not a role model, you know, like a lot of athletes, they just wanted to be the athlete. They didn't sign up to be your kid's role model. They didn't sign up to, to be the way that, that you should have your kid follow, you know? So in that same thought process, you like you are going to be an you are going to be a role model regardless because there's going to be a lot of little kids looking up to you so it's almost like this unspoken responsibility that you know kids are going to watch you so watch what you do and and the same goes for when it comes to activism you know before it wasn't necessarily even a thing you know being politically correct was was the right path to go when you're an athlete now when there's so many avenues and there's so much acceptance about being an activist you know when you have some of the biggest athletes in the world like lebron james just leading leading the way well then of course the trend is going to follow and i don't say trend meaning that a lot of people are following a fad that's cool i mean a lot of people are now more comfortable because the the, the airways have been opened up for athletes to speak their minds and so under that same thought process if you are an athlete and you do feel like you have something to say, I think now is the time where you don't have to be afraid of saying something that the owners might not like, saying something that the sponsors, the 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 anybody, you know, the the pep club, anything at school, you don't really have to be afraid of those things anymore. So I would say the athlete, they don't have to because athletes don't have to do anything. You know, a lot of times people tell athletes everything that they are supposed to do. Athletes don't actually have to do anything. They can just go to practice, play hard and go home. And that's what they're supposed to do when they get a scholarship or a check. But if you do want to be an activist, I think there's no better time to do it. Michael. So I'm going to kind of Go a little story with this, but uh, before I came out, I didn't even know what LGBTQ was. Uh, and when I did come out, that's and that summer I did, you know, I figured it out. Uh, but when I came out publicly, I had no interest of, you know, I wasn't doing it for the community. 
I, I was just doing it just for, for, for my own sake, just to, I wasn't trying to, you know, take a stand or, or, or be an advocate. I had no, had no interest of that. It wasn't until the coming months where I, I received so many emails and so many people uh, was, uh, thank you, thank you for what you've done. And there were so many stories I've read of how I helped people. I was like, wow, the only thing I was, I did was come out. I, I don't even know who you are. And you, you, you're, you're telling me your life story, how I, you know, when I, you ball to your, your parents and you ball to, like, I, I didn't realize that my, me coming out had that ripple effect on so many lives. So I, so I guess by doing that, I put myself in a, a advocate role. Um, but athletes have so much power and so much power. And I'm gonna go back to uh, in 2015 at the University of Missouri, um, the team did a lockout because there was a student. Um, we at, at, at Mizzou, we always say one Mizzou, that we're in this together. It's, there's not just individuals, we're all in this together. That's our motto. And there was a student uh, at the University of Missouri who was going on a hunger strike because he was a black student and there was some injustice uh, stuff that was done uh, on campus that wasn't getting an, enough uh, attention to. So he decided to do his own peaceful protest and going on a hunger strike. Well, I was actually at, uh, on campus uh, working on my master's. And I, I believe he was on week two, uh, week two, and I had no idea that there was a, there was, he was you know, on a hunger strike. It wasn't until the team said, hey, guys, we're, we're not going to play our, any games until Jonathan eats. And it, like, so this, this has been going on for two weeks and no one knew about it until the, the teams took a stand and it made national news. And quickly things, once, when, they, when the team said like, hey, we're not gonna play any games, that's a, that's a lot of money. One game is a lot of money, you know, with TV revenue and tickets and stuff like that. When, when money's on the line, a lot of things start to happen. And sure enough, you know, unfortunately, there was a there was a, a negative ripple effect onto that as well, where you know uh, the the school president resigned, the, the chancellor resigned, and also uh, my coach uh, resigned as well. And but it 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 did prove that there is uh, the teams and players and athletes have a lot of power, and if we use that power to uh, for some positive, good things can come from it. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Um, I think they're really powerful uh, responses, but from both of you, I think there's something really interesting about the collective way in which athletes are able to, to galvanize and, and mobilize in the US, which is very different to uh, European kind of activism, if you like. So is there anything that you would say, Renee, to, to, to athletes perhaps in the UK or across Europe who, who don't find themselves in spaces where their teams support them. Um, and actually they're looking to, to the US as, as examples, if you like. Is there, are there any words of advice that you would give them if they, they really want to be able to express themselves and they find themselves in positions that they can't, but they, they actually want to? Yeah, I think there's strength in numbers, you know, it, you know and Michael just kind of hinted on it where when one person is doing a hunger strike, they might be doing a hunger strike until we don't know how long. But the minute that you do a hunger strike and you bring in other people, a team, you bring in a club, a different thing, now you got national news. So the, re the, the things I would say is, of course, if you're still going to be there, you don't want to cause a fuss in a sense of if, if you do want to stay there. But, you know, there's a term called good trouble. And, and the reason I bring that up is, you know, Congressman John Lewis, he was notoriously known for good trouble, getting in good trouble where Sometimes I think Don Staley said it, but it's okay if people don't like you for saying what's right or for doing what's right. Like that's, that's okay. You know, a lot of times, sometimes people will not like you when you, when you take a stand because it's abnormal, it's different, but if you're doing what's right, then you can live with that. And so I would say that if you want to take a stand, take a stand. And there's plenty of allyship on the internet so that you don't have to feel alone. Michael, it's, uh, do you have uh, any kind of words of advice for athletes that are potentially on this call today? Yes. Uh, so when I came out, I thought, you know, I was hoping that there are other athletes there in professional football and the NFL that are gay, but they just, you know, are living their lives quietly, which is totally fine. 
um, I was hoping that these athletes will also join me because again, as Renee said, there are strength in numbers. And when you're, when you're doing it alone, you know, it, it can be lonely, of course. Um, but, but once I, I felt like when I lost the, the, the uh, football community, I gained a new community in the LGBT uh, uh, community. And I, I just feel like, don't feel like you're, you're alone. There's people out there supporting you. Uh, you do have family and friends out there. Um, so it is just stay strong and, um, and stay positive and stay resilient. Yeah, it's a really important point about fellowship and, and connecting with those political organisations that are outside of sport to, and they, to be able to support you on your journey. I um, had the very uh, distinct honour back in 2017 to, to interview Dr Tommy Smith and uh, 1968 Mexico Olympic Games and he talked to myself and the thousands of other people in this auditorium about the redemptive power of sacrifice being only open to us when we truly understand who we are. So as I'm talking to you, and I'm really honored to be speaking to you guys, I really am, I, I, don't, I don't say things lightly. Um, I, as I'm talking to you, I'm thinking about that because you, you've both made sacrifices. You've both had to go in personally and introspect and get to this point where you are today. It's not, it's not just sitting out a season. It's not just declaring your sexuality. It's much deeper than that. Can you, can you share any of your, 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 your kind of observ observations around that? Because we're having to sacrifice as bl black people are having to sacrifice for the greater cause. And there's a part of me as a, as a black skin woman from Guyana and, and England, I'm thinking, what? why is it that we're having to do this? And as I'm talking to you, I'm reminded of, of Dr. Smith's words. And Renee, have you got any observations around that? It's been, it's been like that since the beginning of time, especially with black women. You know, a lot of times black women have led the charge. The history books don't talk about it as much, but if you wanna find out, you can research. And I tell people that all the time, like even when I opted out, you know, almost kind of to what Michael said, even when I opted out, I had no idea the impact it would have. I mean, I sent it as a tweet. So I didn't think that I was making world stopping news. I just tweeted it out. Um, but it, it surprised me in a sense of how many people were ready for this. Uh, it, it was welcomed so well that that could have been the only, that, that's the only answer after seeing so much negativity. I think people were happy to see that someone was like, okay, she's sick of it too. You know, I think we're all sick of it. And then they were just happy to see that, oh, wow, she's really sick of it. And so I think just, just me opting out, I didn't, I, I really didn't know, you know, I didn't know that I was going to be like an inspiration to a lot of people. I actually just thought that me opting out was going to bring attention to, to what's wrong and what's going on. And me being a professional athlete, you know, I still feel it. And I think that that was shocking for people like, well, you're a professional athlete, you live a certain lifestyle, like what's your deal? And I'm like, my deal is the same deal as everyone else. You know, we're not exempt because we play sports. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't take away, give us a, a get out. It, you know, while some athletes and a lot of people, I saw this somewhere that they were so confused to why the NBA players felt that they were scared. And some NBA players said they were scared. Some NBA players said, you know, that they're terrified for their family and stuff, but people have to realize if, if you're if you're an NBA player and somebody pulls over your cousin, your nephew, your son, they might not know that you're the NBA player. You don't get that pass and it doesn't make it OK, even if you were the NBA player that gets the pass. I think that's what people don't understand. The point is that everyone, when they get pulled over, should have the same type of reaction like, oh, what did I do wrong? Did I not put my blinker on? It shouldn't be, oh, I want to make sure I survive this. Yeah. So just for me, I, I, I just think that it's 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 something that has happened a lot in history as far as black women standing up for a cause. Um, and I'm just happy to be able to, to have a positive change in any aspect of, of, of our culture and society. Okay, thank you, thank you. Michael? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, coming out is, can be, uh, you know, a career sac sacrifice. Uh, it could be a career ending, um, ender. Uh, I think I was very bitter, you know, uh, with the NFL for so many years. And now I, you know, all of the good of me coming out and help so many people, you know, coming out to their families, coming out to their friends, uh, coming out, being uncomfortable the, with themselves. But it's still an issue. If you can be, you know, you can still get fired for being, you know, uh, LGBTQ, uh, which is sad. 
uh, I will be more content, you know, if, are the NFL making progress? Absolutely, they, they are. Slowly, they're like a tortoise, you know, um, they're making slow progress. Progress is always good, but they can, they can, they have the resources, they have the money to step their game up. And, and it's, it's about time they, they start. You know, don't, don't get on the trend, be, be the trend. Um, so I, I, I will be more content if they, you know, have better representation and really get involved. Uh, that would be, I, I will feel more content and better about myself as like, okay, you know, all my sacrifices did not go to waste, uh, at least with the organization. You know, they're, they're, I could see they're making improvements um, and uh, yeah, and, and doing what they can. But until then, I'm still, you know, are you really doing enough? So that's where I stand. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point. You know, it segues into whether or not we can expect sports authorities to do more. Um, and what does that look like? You know, for a lot of them, it takes them a long time. We, we have had an apology from the NFL, but, you know, Colin Kaepernick is still, you know, constructively dismissed. He still is notting any work. And I think, you know, with the launch of that website, uh, the NFL just done around uh, coming out and WNBA leading the way in a lot of this work, there's still more to be done uh, that's beyond kind of the performative gestures. Um, what do we think about that? Do we think, and, and if we think about that within, what leads? Does, does sport lead these issues or, or is it the other way around? Or, or how can these sports authorities actually be ahead of some of this? Or is that possible? Renee? Yeah, I was gonna say the first thing is you have to mean it, you know, and, and that sounds simple, but if you mean it, then you'll move a certain way. Like I, I fully believe that Adam Silver means it. And, and what I say by that is when he has his interviews, he's talking about it. A lot of times if a question is brought up to someone, of course they'll respond, but he's bringing the issue to the, to the press conference. That's, that's different, you know, in a sense of he's bringing, he's talking about it so that there's sh like spotlight set, set on it. So if, if he's doing that, then of course people are going to listen. And of course people are going to follow suit. And so he's the head of the NBA. He means it because of his actions. And, and the same as the WNBA, you know, the, the players wore shirts that had bullet holes in the back. Well, if you're an organization that doesn't mean it, you're not going to allow that. There's going to be a certain point where you're going to be like, all right, you guys, I let you go far enough. The bullet holes are too much, reel it in. But they didn't do that. The players wanted to have bullet holes on the back of their shirt and they had bullet holes on the back of their shirt. And so Again, that to me, that points back to leadership that shows that you mean it. And Kathy Engelbert, she means it, you know, and she's shown she means it before handing out the, the finals MVP trophy. She talked about saying her name. She said Breonna Taylor. You know, she said other women's names. Well, th I mean, to me, that mean you mean it because it's on your mind. It's something you think about. It's something you're striving for. So so for me, the way that these leagues and, and different and different organizations can show that they they're trying to do the right thing is, is mean it. And your actions will show that. Yeah, great, powerful points. I mean, Michael, if, if we think about that and we also think about some of the grassroots organizations that are fighting for injustice out there who are listening into this call and they're and watching and they're thinking about what does, how does this, uh, you know, if I've got a federation or a league that's not supportive of my, my activism, what, what advice would you give to them? Ooh, that's a toughie. Um, <laughs> To be honest with you, my, the, my best advice is to, you know, don't sell your, uh, yourself short. You know, you got to be always be true to yourself, you know, uh, and what you believe in. And if, if you truly believe that, uh, whatever you believe in, I, I do believe that's what you just stay firm. Um, I think that's, that's the best answer I can get. <laughs> well, it's really, it's really important. It's about staying true to who you are. It's your values. That's what leadership's all about, isn't it? How we stand in those values when the times are tough. But I want to kind of just move it along as well and think about how do we move from, from activist to, to organizer? You know what? Because, you know, Michael, you have done that. If, if you like, you'd be, you talked about being an accident, an accidental activist, but you are now an LGBT advocate, you're a campaigner. So how did you move from that activist to organizer? Well, again, it, planning. I think planning is, is, is the most important thing and it's the, it's, the ground, it's the foundation. If you plan it and you kind of mobilize and organize, it's easy. But if you, again, everything was done by accident. It was just awful, pretty much of a whim. 
um, there was a, not enough planning, not enough, uh, not enough people uh, asking for advice. We we thought we knew the whole the whole thing. Uh, so if, if we if we have, there needs to be times at uh, conferences. You know, there this this stuff needs to be planned. It's kind of sad that you, it's like oh, it's common knowledge, it's common sense. No, unfortunately, we don't live in that in that, in that type of world. Stuff like this needs to be planned. It needs to be done right. Uh, so all parties can can walk away, you know, on top. It, you know, it's just if that makes sense. Yeah, no, but perfectly. It's it's you know back to 1968, Tommy Smith and John Carlos. People think that that was a, a, a spontaneous raising of the fist. It was a, a year's worth of campaigning and strategizing as a part of the Olympic Project for Human Rights. So definitely strategy and planning and organization goes within that. So I, I kind of just want to segue and, and think really, that was such a powerful point, Renee, that you made about it being real and meaningful, that you know, in, in, in the European context, the Football Association or other kind of leagues and federations and sports organizations often say, you know, sport and politics don't mix. You know, it's, it's society's problem. You know, athletes are just, you know, shut up and play or just, you know, just be grateful for your spotlight over there on the track or on the on the field. What would be your observations around that? Yeah, I think that that one reporter that said that to LeBron started a whole movement of athlete activists. You know, one 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 person told LeBron to shut up and dribble and more than an athlete was born, you know. And the reason I say that is because she said what everyone else was thinking. Like, like we talked about before, people want athletes to be these super action heroes that are perfect examples for your kids. They don't make mistakes in their personal lives and they perform at a high level. You know, like that's just what they want the athlete to do. The athlete, if the athlete has any home problems, they're like, oh, the money's got to them. If the athlete has any issue with being a role model, then the athlete's stuck up and there's different things, but the athlete is always perceived of a certain way they had to be. And I think that that's done now. You know, you see a lot of different athletes expressing themselves in their clothing. You know, there was used to be rules in how you could enter the, the gym. You had to dress a certain way, a dress code, you know, because Allen Iverson and them had the baggiest clothes known to man. And it was part of the style at the time, but they wanted it to be professional. So there was a dress code, but now you see athletes again, fashion is 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 an opinion and so you see the different fashion ways but that's athletes expressing themselves people don't see it that way but an athlete being able to dress however they want whether it's really out there whether it's 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 normal whether it's business they're allowed to do it and that's that's important to athletes because that's part of their identity so so for me trying to make athletes this one cookie cutter box that's that's old news because athletes, we all have different personalities. We all have different stories. I'm from West Virginia. A lot of people didn't even know black people were there. Here I am. So people <laughs> need to know that we have stories, you know, and, and our stories matter. So that's that shut up and dribble era. Yeah, that's that's done with. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and just as uh, did you have anything to co contribute, Michael, on that? Do you? I was just going to. And, you know, I know LeBron reached out to you, Renee, didn't he, with his yeah. voters uh, campaign. Can you talk a bit about that? How did that happen? Yeah, so I would say not shortly after I opted out, his team reached out and said, hey, we love what you're doing. Would you be interested in being a part of more than a vote? And I was like, yes, yes, what? And they was like, well, we want to tell you what it's about. And I'm like, okay, well, what is it about? And they were like, it's about voter suppression and the fact that you're there in Atlanta you guys are repeat offenders. So we think that you would be perfect for it, you know, because we, we like that you have something to say about it. And I was like, oh, wow, this is even better than I thought. So this was kind of right when more than a vote had kind of taken form. And so it was, it was awesome just to be in on the ground level in a sense of, I remember when State Farm Arena got opened and they asked me, hey, could you make a video telling people all the perks of, of arena polling? And I'm like, um, on it so you know I started telling people how you know it's a big space and now it's a common thing we all know that a lot of different teams open up their arenas we know a lot of different teams have their staff working the polls right now so it's common it's, it's common knowledge I remember when there was just one there was just one arena so for me being a part of more than a vote I actually really felt like I was doing something you know here in Georgia if you guys are watching the news there's still super long lines and it's it's early voting but I'm just excited that people are out there, honestly. Like, I, I wish that we could make it better in a sense that you don't have to sit out there for hours on hours. Like, I obviously wish that wasn't the case, but 
I love to see that people are doing it. It's, it's that important. Yeah, of course. And, and, and Michael, if we think about the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020, changing sports role in social justice in so many ways, how do we sustain this momentum? How do we do that through sports? Uh, hold on, I had wrote, this, uh, wrote this down. Uh, you kind of, um, we go back to Colin Kaepernick. Yeah. You saw, you know, how people started burning the jerseys and, and stuff like that and, and said, and he kind of, went out of the NFL and now we look at it, people will start to rec recognize, okay, there's this, what happened in, uh, to, uh, to George Floyd, that's, that's, that shockwave went throughout the world. You, you have people in London, people in Paris, uh, people all in Europe, people in, in Australia, people protesting um, from this one event. But this things, uh, th these, uh, these police brutality has been going on for years, but people are starting to recognize it more. And I, I believe because of that, you know, uh, it, it, a few years ago, um, uh, Under Armour did this segment with uh, with uh, ESPN, and it was about uh, police building a bridge to uh, to uh, to communities because there were some some communities where where children was did not trust the uh, police, and you can understand why, uh, mm -hmm. especially uh, people of color. Uh, black and, and brown people in particular, people of, uh, of color, not trusting police. And they they built, they built wanted SB4 and of uh, this building a bridge. Now it's a perfect time because of, of, of all the events that's happened. There needs to be a bridge. There needs to be some collaborations to work together to show that, hey, we're, we're, we're on, if you serve the people, serve the people. Do not be against the people. And I think this year was had really a, a bunch of eye openers. Uh, the show uh, to focus on a lot of issues that's is really going on uh, against uh, what's going on with with police and, and brutality and discrimination. Thank you. And and just finally, Renee, you talked really powerfully in your Players Tribune um, article about fueling the moment and about you spoke so beautifully about your mom and the advice that she gave you just before you made that decision. Um, and you know, talking about Martin Luther King's paraphrasing his his amazing um quote when he talks about you know the riots are, are, are the language of the people that are unheard and you talk mm -hmm. really about momentum and i know that's what's behind your foundation how do you think we sustain momentum i think that we don't assume that everything's going to get fixed right when we vote you know, I think a lot of people, we are excited about the election as we should be, but I, I want people to understand that voting is like phase one. It's a phase that a lot of us haven't even started at. So I get the excitement, but it's phase one in a sense of there's so much more that we can do. You know, voting, voting isn't just the full stop. You can vote, then you can also participate in what happens in your community. You know, a lot of times there's, there's town halls, there's different things. And I know it sounds boring, but when you're one of the places that gets opened up too early, well, maybe that stuff isn't so boring anymore when, when that's who we elected in office, you know? And so you have to start, we have to start taking responsibility of what happens in our community as well. Like there, there is policing problems, but we do, we do get to hire, we do get to, I shouldn't say hire, we do get to vote on who picks these people. You know, we get to vote on shares. There's certain things that we can vote on. And so the things that we can have control over, let's control it. Um, and then let's let's build up our communities because a good friend of mine, Seth Cohen said, local is gonna be the new global in a sense of Coachella might not be the move this year because obviously the big numbers, but just go to a new shop that's in your local area. You know, like start exploring in your local areas because it, the economy has to get built up some way. So if we all start building up our local, then I think our global can can excel. So I would just say find ways to, to make a to make a change. And, and on that same note, on November 2nd, you know, our campaign is having a, a workshop. Remember the 3rd of November is having a workshop where we're, it's a pep rally. We're just trying to get people excited. This is different times, this is democracy. And that's exciting to be able to have a say in things. So we're gonna have a pep rally to get people excited, but it's just all the same concept, participate in your community. Brilliant, so it's about that kind of personal agency and finding the space where you can make a difference to use your own. Yep. It's amazing. So we're just kind of gonna 
to, to um, bring this to, to a close just before we get on to the questions from our audience. But just a few quick fire questions that I'm just going to ask you on the spot to, to just answer really quickly, uh, just to end my sentences. So, Renee, I'm going to go with you first. It's just a bit of fun. I'm not yeah. setting you up, honest. Uh, just to finish. Yeah, I'm ready. I like games. I like games. I believe. I believe that we will win. Success is happiness what i know for sure is that love helps wonderful thank you renee you've been amazing michael that was different michael i believe i am great success is when we all win what i know for sure that we will get through with this Wonderful, you both have been amazing. I'm now gonna go to the questions and have a look in the chat. Wow, there's lots. Um, so I'm gonna have a look at these and we're gonna take our, we're gonna go through these and hopefully be able to find uh, the questions. So how do we support athlete activism even as simply as taking a knee where minority players don't have a spotlight or it doesn't even exist. So for example, in Latin America or Eastern Europe. So that's a kind of, you know, that question around not having support. Yeah. What would you say, Renee? Yeah. I would say kind of the same thing, you know, um, then you be that person that kneels, you know, like we're talking about, okay, it hasn't gotten to, to Europe yet. Well, then that means that there's space for somebody to be the first one. And then once you become the first one, then you'll have, People, hopefully you'll have people join in with you. Somebody, people put your hands on your shoulder, you know, and showing the support, that allyship that we talk about. But if you want to do it, then there's nothing wrong with being the first one. Great. And the, another question here, um, Michael, this would be good for you, actually. What responsibility does the media have to support athletes as activists and how can they do this effectively? Absolutely. They need to stop uh, priving in into the personal lives uh, of, you know, our player, you know, focus on uh, he or she's, uh, you know, skills instead of, you know, what they're doing in the shower, or, you know, stop, you know, who, who are they dating? They're not TMZ, you know, uh, focus on their skills. Well, shouts and to my people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think that, you know, that uh, that is something huge for the media going forward and, and, and stop focusing on the private lives of athletes. Great. So when athletes stand up for what they believe in, they often face vitriol from spectators in stadiums and especially on social media. How can you bring fans along with you? Michael, Renee? Uh, okay, yeah. Renee, Renee, go for it, Renee. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, for me, I think that real fans get it. You know, like if you're a real fan of LeBron James or you're a real fan of the Lakers, then that means you should care about what that player feels. If you care, if you're a fan of Kyrie Irving, you should care what Kyrie Irving feels just like that. It goes back to the the athletes aren't just the person dribbling on the court or throwing balls on the field or catching balls on the field. It's there. There there's more to them. So if, if an athlete says that they're hurting then you shouldn't say, that doesn't matter. I just want you to be an athlete. Like that's, that sounds ridiculous when you say it right now. So when a Kevin Love says he struggles with mental illness, you can't say, who cares? Just keep playing. That sounds crazy when you say it in real life, but that's what people do to athletes. Right. How important is it for athletes to know what the owners and the coaches believe in, where they, where, where they put their money politically. So will unified teams continue to advocate for specific candidate, candidates and their platforms? Renee, you wanna take this one? <laughs> I just took it, Michael, it's your you guys, turn. You're still, a, you're still a professional athlete. <laughs> okay, so the question was like, how do we feel about teams advocating for particular people? You know, that those political gains and the kind of the, the politics, the internal politics that go with specific candidates in, in, you know, within. Oh, oh, well, my response to that would be that that's been going on since the beginning of time. I saw a, a study where a certain amount of NFL owners donated to campaigns, a certain amount of NBA owners donated to campaigns. It's very, uh, you can find all of this. That's why I said, 
for as much bad or harm that people think the internet does, it's also such a source of information. And you can find out that going back elections, way elections before, owners have been making statements by who they support, who they donate in these campaigns. It's nothing new. So when people tell us to, to stick to sports and if owners are involved in sports, then sports have always been political. Absolutely. So Michael, here's one for you. It's, it, this is about systemic racism and homophobia in, in soccer um, and where the, there's a lack of representation from black or Asian or ethnic minority backgrounds or sexuality, religion, across the spectrum within the, the senior kind of levels of those organizations. How do you overcome the, the systemic racism and the homophobia in those spaces? Well, you look back at uh, the 2018 World Cup when the French won. Uh, I believe there was 33 percent on, on that team were was black and Muslim. And within their own country, there have been uh, even discrimination. You guys just won the World Cup to celebrate as a country and you, your own countrymen are, are there. There are uh, systemic racism within your own country about the, the black players and the Muslim players on on that team. So that it, it, it's, it's, when is it going, what are you guys going to take? Like when are you guys going to get through your heads of, of I don't, I don't understand uh, how you, excuse me, I'm going to kind of slow down. Um, I see that, I see the pride, but the, like, are you, are, are people really ashamed of of, and you cannot celebrate as a whole, as a country, as Frenchmen. And that's just the same over here. Um, we, we're not together, you know? I feel like they're, I, I'm, I'm rambling my thoughts. I, I, forgive me, Michelle, but. No, no, I think it's a really important point. And when we make important points, sometimes that happens. It's like, how do we bring that collective energy and, and collaboration where we don't agree? You know, and then it's, it's, it's okay that we don't agree, but we've got to find that space to bring everybody along with us along that train. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, there's something in that about, you know, I, I don't know how you feel about that, uh, Michael. Would you, would you want to be a part of any of those, those kind of leadership spaces at, uh, in, in the infrastructure of the sports ecosystem broadly? You know, it may not be within the NFL, but... Is that something that you may be interested to, in? A lot of former athletes kind of find themselves as administrators and people in power because they have such a brilliant nuanced view of the, the world. I can see someone if someone's holding my hand along the way, of course, you know, and doing what I can. Um, but also I, I can only think about how some of these players feel because in, on the field, for instance, we can't hear the fans, you know, they, they have to, unless we're on the sidelines. We can't hear, you know, there's a lot of people who talk smack and, you know, it can, and people don't talk enough about the mental, what can it do for you for mental health reasons? And I, I know professional sports don't focus a lot on mental health uh, issues. I went through a phase of depression when, when I was done playing and I'm not going to go to all the specifics of what happened, but it, it is a very demanding uh, thing, uh, a, a job, a demanding job. And it can, it, and it, it affects your health. In many ways, and I went through depression for a long time, and so uh, there's some things that definitely needs to be talked about in professional sports, uh, especially for athletes that uh, when their careers when their careers are done. Yeah, I mean it's such an important point around looking after the mental health of athletes and their emotional health and well-being, and it's a responsibility of the leagues and the federations and the teams to be able to make sure that those those structures and those initiatives are in place for athletes. Is that that's something you're you're kind of nodding along with, Renee? Yeah, definitely. For sure. Okay, so we have covered quite a bit of ground. We've covered all of the questions that have been sent to me. So I feel like I've done my job. I'm hoping <laughs> you did good. You did good, Michelle. Yeah. That's okay. But I mean, one of the last things that I just want to, to ask both of you is, is what's next? I know that the foundation is, is something that's really important to you, Renee. Um, so can you just tell us what's next for you? Yeah, so it's been a lot of planning on the 24th. I'm gonna go and volunteer down at State Farm as a poll worker. And then on November 2nd, I'm gonna throw a pep rally for 
it's a celebration for people that's already voted and it's a let's get ready to rumble for the people that haven't and are going to fight the fight on November 2nd. So uh, yeah. that's what's next for me. Remember the 3rd of November. Let's get ready to rumble. That's what I remember from that. <laughs> Michael, <laughs> what's next for you? Are you slaying it in your motivational speeches? What's happening for you next? Well, right now, things are pretty slow for me. Um, I'm, I just actually left. Uh, I was in Portland, Oregon for a few months and I left. And I'm, right now I'm just kind of restarting things and, and trying to figure things out. And um, I'm really blessed to be around family again. And it's been very helpful these last two months. Fantastic. It's great to hear that you're taking that time for yourself because it has been a joy speaking to both of you today. I have really enjoyed it. I hope you have as well. I hope everybody Absolutely. on our call has. We have listened, we have talked about some tough subjects, but we have found the kind of inspiration from your stories of resistance. So thank you so much. And to everybody on this call and watching online, please sign up for the Football uh, People's Fair Network Festival. It is amazing. They've got some incredible speakers across this week. So make sure that you go online and you support the Fair Network and support Renee's foundation. Go online, find it, and make sure that you look out for Michael and across all of his social media and support his, him in his endeavors. He's an amazing speaker. And we have been privileged to have both Renee and Michael with us today. My clock has just turned six. 6 p.m. Oh my gosh, I think we have won. We have won. Well done, Renee. Well done, Michael. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you very much to everybody on this call. And we wish you a very good evening, a very good afternoon, and a good night. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. It's great. Well, that went. Oh, oh yeah, we got to get off of here. Bye, Mike.